And it was about when I was about 29, the PTSD, that's when things went really badly for me. So sort of like, it wasn't just the PTSD. I made a, I made a lot of dumb decisions, nothing to do with PTSD. So I'm not just, um, but I wound up homeless, not just because I had PTSD. I also made a lot of dumb decisions, which was Edward Zier's fault. <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to my Against All Odds series where my guests share their inspiring and heartwarming stories of overcoming their challenges against all odds. My guest today is Edward Zia, marketing mentor and master coach at Excellence Above Coaching. Edward has experienced many difficulties in life from homelessness to PTSD to making wrong choices but today he has helped thousands become master persuaders and influencers, giving them the skills and resources to excel at their roles. Listen on as he shares how he overcome the many challenges that was thrown in his path, drawing strength from unshakable belief in God and a strong determination to make his life better. Hi everybody and welcome to my YouTube channel and please meet my friend Edward Zia. How are you Edward? Oh my God, Lynn, it's great being here. And I've got to say, I love YouTube and your viewers are such attractive, beautiful people. <laughs> well, thank you. And you know, Edward, the reason why I wanted to interview you today is because I was inspired by um, someone. I, I read a book called Against All Odds by Jeffrey Letts. So everyone should buy that book when it's out soon, coming soon. So if you're watching this video, it might be already out. Um, but the book really was telling a story of how his life was just full bad luck, you know, from so many, uh, he was an orphan, basically, you know, parents dying and then drugs and all that and homelessness and everything. And then turning his life around to becoming a millionaire. And when I read it, I was so inspired. And I'm like, you know what? I know more people like that, you know? And so I wanted to invite you because I know that you've turned your life around and now you're like the master marketing coach and LinkedIn influencer. And you're how many um, followers you've, you're, you're getting now? 40,000 or something? 40,000 yesterday, so, um, which is really cool. I used to, I used to have zero followers, so 40,000 yes. is bigger than zero. Exactly, right? And so you went from, I'm not going to tell all your story. I want you to tell your story firsthand. And so I want people, to, when they watch this, they're going to be inspired by, you know, it doesn't matter what your background was, yep. is, was, whatever it is. And, you know, for, for myself, and the reason why I'm so driven by that too is because I have the same story. I was just had nothing. I didn't know where to go next. And so if we can hear more stories like this, then I think it's going to give us that inspiration and go, I can do it as well. So over to you, Edward. Bring us back to the past of your first struggle. Yeah, well, I've had uh, many struggles in my life, but the ones I think I want to focus on is probably when I was... Um, just before I became a teenager, I was about 10 or 11. So what happened to me, my original, and I'll say this to everyone, my upbringing from zero to 10 years old was absolutely awesome. So I was like, I was basically like, I don't know if you watch South Park. I was like Eric Cartman. I was spoiled. I had computers, I, like flawless upbringing. I was literally Eric Cartman up till about the age of 10. Right. And what happened was, this is really bad. My, um, mom really had some bad cancer and it led to a big family breakdown. So without so much going to the actual detail of what happened, um, there was actually a family breakdown where I ended up having nowhere to live. Um, I sort of fell through a gap in the system and ended up literally homeless for a short period there. And um, I think I was about 11 years old and being homeless as an 11 year old was a massive, well, it's a shock to any system, but as an 11 year old, and I, and I say this quite proudly, I had a very good childhood, really good childhood but it was that tipping point where it sort of went transition straight into darkness. And it was crazy. It was a very um, sudden shock of reality. And it set my life on a very totally different course. You know, I was, um, was homeless for quite a few days. Um, I was only homeless for about five days. Whilst that doesn't sound like a lot, it's a lot to an 11 year old. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I said to you today, I was homeless for five days. You'd say, Oh, you're a weekend. Just get used to it. <laughs> 11 year old. No, no not a Mm -hmm. Any, it's not good for an 11 year old. Yeah, do it to, to, it to, do it to me, but don't do it to an 11 year old. Anyway, uh, so what happened was, um, I ended up getting helped out. Um, a group of actual local Aboriginals helped me out. I love our Aboriginal community and the Salvation Army came to my rescue and eventually I was reunited with my family and um, yeah, it was pretty crazy. That, my, that was my original experience of homelessness. Okay, tell us more. What happened after that? What, what was your next struggle that made you feel like, you know, life was just a lot harder you know, for yourself or, or that's what life is. It's hard. What was that? What's another example? 
Yeah, so that was that was a big part of it. Um, probably later on, um, I spent a bit of time in the foster system, but that sort of um, that was actually not a huge part of the story. Where I think it got very hard was later on when I got a bit older. Um, I went I went and joined the army, which is awesome, and I was very lucky. I got seconded to work in Canberra with the federal government. I did all this cool, very um, very secret squirrel cool stuff, right? Which I was very 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 lucky to do. I was very lucky to get picked up for that. And I almost got killed. Yes, whoever thought doing drug busts would be dangerous, but it is not. So, you know, it'd be... anyway, I was doing a lot of undercover drug work. I almost died. It was really bad. You know, I got injured very badly. I was in a um, an out of death experience. You know, I was in a coma and stuff. I was I was in really bad shape. I was very much on the edge. Um, and that was what was interesting is that that experience actually wasn't as traumatic as what it sounds. Ironically, right. It was actually, I got a really bad case of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder from that experience. And that actually hit me a bit later. Um, I had an onset, it happens a lot actually, PTSD can often hit you years later. And that's when I got, I got really mentally ill in my late 20s. And that's when I wound up homeless. And that was sort of probably the lower point of my journey. Right? Yes, I remember that. And that's what I wanted you to bring us to. That, yeah, that in your 20s, you were homeless again. Yes. Yeah, I, it was in my late 20s, sort of early yes. 30s. Um, I've got my late, late 20s actually. I was, um, yeah, I actually spent a good 10 months homeless, right? And um, that was very tough and I was very sick at the time. I had PTSD and um, it was it was crazy. It was absolutely okay. crazy. That's where, you know, God came into it. Um, I okay. So what yeah. happened? All right. So I would imagine you would have felt, uh, you know, you're having depression as well and you are homeless. Like what made you go, you know what? This can't be my life. And there was a turning point. Introduced to me, God, whatever it is that helped you. There was actually, it was more anxiety. I never actually got depression. I got anxiety. Oh, anxiety. So, okay. Yep. I, I never actually got, um, I never ever, I actually, I don't think I've ever actually suffered from depression, but I've, I've always had problems of anxiety from the PTSD. So um, mm. best way to put it is um, Robert Downey Jr. Who, who's actually a PTSD sufferer himself. You know, the original Iron Man films, how, so ironically, Robert Downey Jr., the man, has PTSD and his character, Tony Stark in Iron Man, also suffers from PTSD. Ah, okay. I don't know if you remember a few scenes in Iron Man, he'll have a panic attack and he'll like lean against his Ferrari or whatever going, uh, he has that. He does it a few times in the Iron Man films. And it's a lot in the comics as well. Um, I used to do that. I used to have really, I used to have about four or five panic attacks a day. It was really bad, really bad. Yep. I was very sick at the time, very sick at the time. And it was a lot of God, a lot of Jesus that really sort of helped me. Uh, reintegrate into society and you said the h word off camera hillsong hillsong was actually one of the original churches that i got involved with to rebuild my life so um you know full shout out to hillsong i'm a i'm a, I'm a huge um you know uh, acolyte for the cause yeah so with that anxiety actually you just triggered my memory i know my friend who his daughter started to get this anxiety attacks like it yeah. was just out of nowhere from someone from a daughter who was very happy and and positive to all of a sudden having multiple anxiety attacks for months on end did that kind of happen suddenly to you was it just kind of this like health episode that made you become an in, in anxious person it kind of did actually, because what happened was, um, so what happened was, so I got injured very bad. Um, so what was interesting though, is after the government gave me a good bit of money, they were really good to me. So after I got injured, I ended up going to uni and I'm still, I was still like um, 20 at the time. So I was still quite young. So I went to, went to uni, um, 21, 21, anyway, it was 20, 21. And I went to uni, um, actually did a degree and I ended up going into corporate Australia. Right. And I actually did really well. And, I thought it was all behind me. I was like 26, 27. I had the nice suits, a nice car. Um, I had a lot of very, very uh, young ladies uh, courting me at the time. And I was, having a, I was having a good run, right? Obviously, I got to keep it PG-13, but I was doing okay. <laughs> Yeah, I was like the hot Persian guy, the nice suits, the six-figure <laughs> income. But um, over probably in about when I was about 27, the, that's when the PTSD started really hitting me. And over a few years, I gradually got worse. I still did very well career-wise. But I was getting very sick out of business hours. I was not doing well, not doing well. Yeah. And it was about when I was about 29, the PTSD, that's when things went really badly for me. So sort of like, it wasn't just the PTSD. I made a, I made a lot of dumb decisions, nothing to do with PTSD. So I'm not just, um, but I wound up homeless, not just because I had PTSD. I also made a lot of dumb decisions, which was Edward Zier's fault. Mm -hmm. But that combined with the PTSD just formed a, a cocktail. I had no money. Um, yeah. Yes. And, I was, and, and 
very, very quickly. And that was interesting. And then, then I sort of made my way to Sydney as a, as a homeless drifter, made my way to Sydney just to start my life again. Okay. So when you were young, so although I was going through a lot of challenges when I, when I was growing up, but I always knew in my heart that I was going to do well in the future. Like I, I knew I was going to be successful. Did you have that in you or did you really thought that your life was just going to be this shit? Sorry, my, my swearing, but yeah. Did you <laughs> kind of already knew deep down that you were made for something great or it was something you developed later on? No, I kind of had that inkling. I suppose it's what it was. I converted to Christianity in my mid twenties, right? So, uh, which is good. So in about my mid twenties is when I converted to Christianity and it was awesome. Right. So, and, and I suppose as well, I was already a very successful, I, was, I suppose for me, I was very lucky because I already achieved a lot of success before I got sick. And so I, was, I was like, I was a federal agent when I was there an acting federal agent when I was the age of 20, right? 1920. So I already had that. And I was a very successful corporate. So I already had that image of success. So I knew when I lost everything, I knew it was a very temporary thing, right? So, and, but also as well, it's also the faith in God as well. So, you know, um, so for example, I come from a Middle Eastern background and um, from a Middle Eastern Christians tend to play the game very differently to a lot of, let's say, Anglo Christians. We pray a lot. We pray a lot. It's a bit more of a Middle Eastern thing, right? There's just kind of Middle Eastern cultural thing. So we pray a lot more, a lot more God centric than your average, you know, you know, Anglo Saxon church, so to speak. And so I pray all the time. So it was really with the help of Jesus and God, I was able to sort of get back on my feet and um, not get back on my feet. That's not the right way of putting it, but reframe my life into a more godly direction. Gotcha. So your life kind of went, um, you know, it was up, it went really down and then went up and then it went down again in your twenties. So, right. Like as in it was up at the beginning, then in your, when you were 11, it went down and then went up, went down. And so, yeah, cause whereas with me, it was more like it was down and then, you know, I, change and then it started to go up so what yeah what was the lesson at all in that sense like how in terms of relapsing and and you know what what message or advice could you say about life about people maybe you know what to expect in terms of up and down in life well i'll give you this answer i'll give you a very um faith-driven answer right very faith-driven answer and i just want to say this for the wonderful audience as well like whether you're a christian you're islamic you're a jew you believe in crystals i actually don't care right what i'm saying is is that being a person of faith. So I have the viewpoint that, you know, it's, there are many different paths to worshiping the same God and I'm respectful of all of them. And what I found is that the people of faith, be it the Hindus, Christians, Muslims, Jews, whatever, don't care. It's the people of faith. And this isn't just my opinion. You can see this all throughout human history, right? It's the people of faith that do very well in these situations. Okay. Because at the end of the day, materialistically, it was an up and down experience spiritually it was a rising experience so overall mm. and, and so that's what it is aha moment for me right there the way you just described it oh my god i love that yeah, yeah. yeah because spiritually you're just going getting better and better and better with yourself personal development but it's the material side okay go on continue <laughs> i want to give a shout out to hindus and Hari krishnas because they get us christians aren't very good at this i'm gonna have a shot at our own camp here right <laughs> So if you're a Christian, you're going to hate me for a second, but hear me, hear me, right? A lot of Christians, and I'm, and again, I'm, I'm having a shot at myself here too, by the way. So I'm just having a general shot at our own camp. In the whole Christian camp, we can be a bit materialistic. I'm the first to say that, right? And the Bible, Jesus, not just Jesus, but God, Noah, Jesus, all the disciples say over and over and over again that materialism is a barrier to spirituality, Right? And what I love about the Hindus and Hare Krishnas, they totally get that. So they'll do the whole, you know, literally shave their heads and live in an austere monastery. And that's how they get really spiritual, right? You don't get really spiritual hanging out in cafes with nice suits and cars. It doesn't happen, right? It doesn't happen. So the Hindus and Hare Krishnas, I mean, love or hate them. I think they're awesome, by the way, but they get this, right? So to me, it's the austerity that helps you become more spiritual and that austerity I encountered is what improved my spiritual journey. And I actually said this at, at, at the peak of my homelessness, and I said it, then I'll say it now. If someone could come in and say, Ed, I'm living in my car and I'm cold. Um, Ed, I can go back in time and put you back where you were. No, not interested. You go away. Like even at the, I actually said that to myself. I said, I'd much rather be living in my car, becoming more spiritual and closer to God than running around in my old six-figure life. Mm -hmm. I was very clear on that. I said, I don't care if, 
I don't care if Noah or Jesus um, or Vishnu or Muhammad himself come and say, Ed, I can get you out of this. No, leave me alone. I'll figure, no, go. I want to do this myself. Yeah, yeah. And you know, um, so what was the term austere? I mean, I've never heard of that word. Yeah. So austerity means a lot of things, right? And, but I'll give you a, I'll keep, I'll give a spiritual answer, right? Um, it means a lot of things in economics and that, which I won't go into in politics, but austerity is a reference to basically having only what you need to survive. So it's a very form of frugal mm. sort of living. So what, again, a shout to the higher Christians and the Hindus, they're really good at this, right? And us Christians aren't very good at this, is that they get austerity because they know that when you put someone in an austerity type of environment, like, you know, you got your head shaved, you're living on rice and tofu and you're not on the internet, Right. That's how you get really, and you just meditate and pray. That's how you get very spiritual. Mm. And they get that. We don't get that. We're like, this is a Christian prayer. Oh my God, I love Jesus. Help me make lots of money and yeah. much. <laughs> I'm out of here, right? Yeah, and you're getting your expensive car and drive off. That's a Christian prayer, right? The, the real Hindus, they get it, right? They're really good at this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I was going to interview you this for against all odds kind of story and then to do another video about um, God. But you know what, as, I, as you're talking, I'm seeing there is a relationship there. You know, for me going from, again, from, from the odds to turning my life around was because I went, God help me, you know, and I, that was my journey to spirituality 10 years ago. And the title, you know, against all odds from Jeffrey, who I've spoken about, he's also a kingdom builder, a, a you know, a, a Christian because his life was changed when he, bumped into a group of people guys who said um we're doing bible study and he's like what the hell bible study and then he kind of like was open mind because his life was just already crap and then his life changed after that right and so i wonder the more people i want to interview through this against all odds topic i wonder how many has relied on the the power of god to kind of change their life because it seems like it's a pattern here i bet you it's all of them and i'll give you this answer right when I was quite secular and I, I didn't really believe in anything, right? And this is before I was a Christian. I noticed that all the movers and shakers were all people of faith, right? Mm -hmm. All of them. There were no exception. Be it, I'm not saying they're all Christians. You would yeah. have like, you know, be it, they'd be, they'd be Jews. They'd be Muslims. They'd be Christians. They'd be Hindus. They even hire Krishnas. I noticed that I never, ever saw an atheist or a non-believer in a position of authority. No, just never, you just didn't, you just didn't mm. see them. You just don't see them, right? They'd always be people of faith. And then I did a bit of research. Throughout history, right, it's always been people of faith that have run society, right? Yes, you've had some communist... I'm talking overall, you've had some communist blips, but ultimately those, those civilizations have never sustained themselves. You know, Soviet Union, case in point, the Soviet Union became the Russian Federation which is now a Russian Orthodox religious state, right? Case yeah. So the sustainable civilizations and leaders have always been people of faith, be it in the, you know, the Christian and the non-Christian world. Now I bring this up very importantly. So I was noticing this as a secular guy. I was noticing the believers are going places. The non-believers aren't getting anywhere. I was already picking up on that pattern very early. Yeah. Yeah. And cause the thing is, um, I just find that if you believe in God, it just gives you more faith, more strength, more courage to actually go for bigger dreams, you know, like you wouldn't dare. And because you know that he's got your, your, your back and everything will work out, you dare to go for the big dream. So it kind of just makes sense. That's why it is what it is. And, and I'm going to say, and, and I'm going to use an example before I do, I'm going to give it back to you, Lynn. I mean, you've done an amazing job. I mean, you came out, you know, Vietnamese immigrant, you came out to Australia of nothing. Um, and I, I've said this to a lot of people, before I became an influencer, I knew about you. So before I became a top LinkedIn influencer, I was already following you. I already knew. <laughs> <what> you, <were laughs> so, so you were an influencer way before I was. I didn't right? feel it. I didn't think of I was one. <laughs> you, were. You, you, you may not, okay, you may not thought you were, right? Whether you mm. identified as one or not, you were an influencer then. It's mm. sort of like. Actually, that's a funny, a funny point. If someone says, Ed, what's your gender? Do you identify, identify as male or female? I identify as an influencer. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm now going to identify as that new gender. Anyway, um, but what I was saying is, is that I'm now gender fluid influencer. That's my gender now. <laughs> but, I was, but I was following you as an influencer 
um, way before I became one. Way mm, thank right. you. And testament to you, Lynn. You did that. Well, yeah, I think I've always felt the need to inspire others on my way to wherever I'm going. You know, like I always feel like whatever I know, I might know 1% more than you. I want to share what I know. Then, it, you know, I could pull more people along the way to my success. And so I was always just throwing myself out there and, you know, and, and that's the thing. And I think, you know, you're touching the point on influencer and, you know, I think a lot of people nowadays are getting too caught up with trying to be an influencer yep. and not forgetting that the purpose of influencing people. And just, if you could enjoy the process of sharing advice and doing what you do, because you genuinely care about people, like people like you felt I was an influencer and that's all it matters. It's the, it's the, the people that you touch, whether it's one or it's a hundred or it's a thousand. So yeah, good point. Um, okay. So talking about God, I, the reason why we also wanted to chat today was that you had some thoughts around what's happening in the world right now and, and, you know, God being part of it. Well, yeah, tell me your thoughts. Cause you're the man I go to for, for, for like, it's almost like prophecy. You're like a prophet. <laughs> Yeah. Well, look, I, I, and thank you, Lynn. And I'm very lucky because I'm connected to some very powerful people, right? So I get, I get mentored and advised by very, very smart people, um, people who advise world leaders. I'm sort of, I'm, I'm connected to the right people. Very lucky for that. And what's interesting is that what we're seeing globally is a conservative, nationalistic type of revitalization in all civilizations, right? Well, those big words, you got to explain it yeah. like in baby terms, please. <laughs> So what it is is that I'll unpack it a bit, right? So I'm, I'm throwing some big words around. And I think that's to Dr. Steve Turley. Dr. Steve Turley, great guy on YouTube, huge fan. Everything he said has come true. Um, he predicted Trump winning the election, right? Dr. Steve Turley, right? And I'll use him as an example. That's where I, I learn a lot of stuff from. Great guy. Um, Dr. Steve, you're a great guy. Keep up the good work. Anyway, so what it is, so I'm just going to shout him out. But everything I've learned a lot from him. What's been interesting about the what you're having globally you've had a change from the old globalist world order into a new conservative age. Meaning that if you go back to like the nineties and two thousands, it was all about you're a global citizen and all cultures are awesome. And, you know, you shouldn't talk about religion too much. Um, you, you've got to be politically correct and all this stuff. And, you know, the flag's not a good thing. Um, other countries are better than your country. That was the narrative, especially, right? Now, what was interesting about it is that over time, it hasn't quite worked out for a lot of the world. A lot of countries are now reasserting their own nationality. So I'll use India as an example with Modi, right? Modi is a complete populist, meaning he's all about India and India's identity and protecting Hinduism and their civilization. He's sort of pushing back on the global's forces, right? Uh, in the UK, you've got Boris Johnson. You've had obviously the Brexit, right? It's like, look, we're not, we're not part of this European thing. We want to be our own people, right? That's them reasserting their own national identity. Uh, Australia, you've had a similar thing. You know, Australia's always been quite like that, but it's been sort of like, hang on, we've got borders. And if you want to immigrate, you've got to, go, you got, to, you got to be part of our civilization. You've got to speak English and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So all across the world, you have civilizations, even China, you know, doing the same thing. We're Chinese. We've got, we got the right to control what comes into our country. So you've got a lot of countries now which are saying we are our own country, our own civilization. And whilst we love the world, we're also going to protect our own nationalistic identity. Mm, so that's what's happening in the world right now. Yeah. Even a good example, like um, Jacinta Ardern, the uh, Prime Minister. New Zealand, of yes. Yeah, I, I like her a lot. She's a huge nationalist. She's, she was one of the first people to shut down the borders when Corona came out. Mm. Right? Yeah. No, you just can't come in that was complete nationalism at work. Yeah. Right? So what has God, God, what's God's uh, play in this? Remember well, you were talking, yeah. What's God's play in this is that as countries have moved from sort of globalization and nationalization, they've gone back into their own customs, culture and tradition, mm. such as I'll use Modi. I'll use a, non, a very big example. Modi is Hinduism was being etched away by a lot of globalism. And he came back in and said, no, India, we're Indians, we're a great Hindu country and we love Hinduism, right? Reasserting their national religion, right? Mm. The um, great example is the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union collapsed, right? And um, it broke up in all these different countries, right? 
the remnants of the Russian Federation now is a, it's a post-communist state, obviously, but the Russian Federation, they're Russian Orthodox. They're all Christians, right? Mm. They put it, they're crazy Christians. They put us to shame. Uh, the Philippines, you've got, you know, um, not just Dutarte, but in the Philippines, they've come out and said, no, we're a Catholic civilization. We're the Philippines. Mm. We're not going to be eroded by it. And so a lot of countries have backed off from globalization and gone, mm. this, is us, this is our civilization. This is who we are. Yeah. Right? So is this a good thing or a bad thing for you that you think? Well, from a faith driven view, if you want to look, it depends on what, if you're a globalist that hates God, it's not a good thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. If you, if you don't like people of faith, it's a bad thing. If you respect faith, if you're a God driven faith person, it's awesome because you have all these countries and all these civilizations who I'll use another example, Dubai, right? You know, Dubai, the capital of the United Arab, em Arab Emirates. I love that place. One of my favorite cities in the world. They do the same thing. They're open and tolerant of all religions. However, they protect their own mm. local way of life. They protect their own religion. They protect their own people. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know what? A lot of people poke fun at Dubai. I think, you know, we look after our family members. Why can't a country look after their own citizens? Yeah, got it. Makes sense. Because when you try to push on everything, everyone to be the same, it just can't make it the same. And that's why you have so much conflict. Yeah. And that's what globalized, that's why glo a lot of, yeah, I love globalization, but the cultural aspects of globalization have broken down a lot because again, it was in a way erasing cultures. So like high Indian, you can no longer be a Hindu. Um, you know, um, high Christian, you can't talk about God in the workplace anymore. Right. Mm. And so it's forcing all these people into this one. So it, it, it's the opposite of diversity, actually. It's, forcing people to erase their own civilizations and buy into this globalistic project. Right. And over time, it just completely broke down. Right. It's just, you know, one, uh, every day it just breaks down more and more and more and countries are now turning back to customs, culture and tradition and faith. Yeah. So interesting. So, you know, the whole point of this video is that we wanted to people to know that, you know, we, we all have challenges in life and, and we hit rock bottom but it's turning to God to really guide us to follow our path. Right. And the other thing is you gotta, you know, sometimes people go, but why is God doing bad things in this world? Why is there bad things happening? Yeah. What would your answer be? I know you've much more experience as a Christian. I can't answer, but I just know in my heart the reason, but I can't articulate, but what would you say to people going, why is there so much bad things? Why is God making bad things happening? Well, to be honest with you, it's a hard question. Um, I, my answer is not going to be very, I don't think anyone has the answer to that question, right? I certainly don't, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have the answer to it. However, what I understand it to be is the world is a complex system and we have free will, right? Yes. So there's, for whatever reason, we live in a very complex universe and system, which is governed by chaos, right? It's not governed by rules our universe is governed by chaos and in a way for whatever reason which is far beyond my mortal comprehension i don't think anyone has the answer to be honest with you right i don't think anyone does my very poor answer to that question is is that we live in a complex system that god influences but doesn't completely control for whatever reason yeah he doesn't control he influences it but doesn't control the whole system yeah so bad stuff will happen but God will throw good people in the way to undo it. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. I love that it's freedom. You know, it's not forced upon. It's like God doesn't just create you and go, you have to believe everything I'm saying. And it's like a parent going, you have to listen to me because this is good for you. You're not going to listen because you haven't experienced life. You haven't experienced your own experience and you can choose whether that was good or bad and learn from it. And it's much more interesting to live than it is being forced you know, even like I said, your parents go, Hey, I don't think you should do this because I know it's going to be bad. As a yeah. kid, you're not going to listen. You're going to, like, let's say, touching a stove, you're going to touch it and go, Oh, sh okay, now I know it's hot, right? And so, but then at least you've learned your own lesson and you know what's good, what's bad. And, and yeah, and that's, that's the thing with life. And I feel like um, God allows that to happen so that we learn a better lesson. Like, if we've gone through dark times or we've done something bad, we know how it feels. We go, I don't want that to happen to other people. And then we start to kind of, um, well, even getting closer to God, I feel like going through challenges means that you've got to go, I am not that 
you know, sometimes you can get arrogant if you think you know everything and I'm the best, mm -hmm. right? But when you, uh, you, you, you've been kind of punished or, or things bad happen to you, you are more humble. You go, okay, I'm not the best at everything or, or I can't control my life. Can you help me? And it, it creates humbleness. So I just think it kind of have to happen. Uh, what is your thought on uh, we are spiritual beings having a human experience? So I hear this all the time and I get that. What's your take on that? Yeah, it, it's, I would agree with it, but my reservations of that is people take it too far, right? Because we're just spiritual beings and this is just a temporary human experience. The problem with that thinking too far is it puts people into a very much, well, we're just here on earth for a short time anyway. Who cares what we do? Screw the environment. Who gives a rat? It, it, that, I agree with the statement, but the thinking attached to it can be very poisonous and toxic because yes, we're spiritual beings having a human experience, but I suppose I'm from the human experience. We're having a worldly experience because there's more life on the planet than just humans, right? Mm. There's animals, there's critters, there's creatures, right? There are other forms of life that we haven't discovered yet. So, and that's the whole thing about, you know, this is why, um, you know, when people say, you know, humanity first, humanity first, right? Well, I'm all for humanity first, but we're kind of messing up the environment. Shouldn't we improve the environment? Shouldn't we do some ecology? Yes. The reason why I bring that up is a lot of people saying, well, we're spiritual beings, who cares? Ah, who cares if a bunch of whale dies? Who cares? Terrible, right? Ter so it's terrible thinking that. So yes, we're spiritual beings, but I think we're having a worldly experience, not a human experience. I think us humans need to respect there are other forms of life on the planet that are non-human that are still sentient. Yeah, thank you. You're such a wise guy. Now, what, uh, what do you see, where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? Like what's the future project for Edward? Yeah, well, it's actually pretty transparent. So a few things, and I'll let a secret cat out of the bag as well. Um, so, which I haven't actually said publicly yet, but I'll say it now. So what, what it is for me, for, and big shout out to wonderful wife Lassie as well. Our journey is to continue our faith-driven growth as influencers, helping people and becoming successful ourselves at the same time. And also as well, as we've spoken off camera, is, um, you know, uh, politics as well. Politics is very important to me. Politics is a huge vehicle for creating change in the world. And as, as time passes, I get more and more political and involved in that sort of thing, you know, helping protect the rights of people across the world. So for me, politics is becoming, as you can tell by my LinkedIn feed, quite important based on my huge weirdo love for our glorious Australian prime minister, Scott Morrison. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. You've got such a great sense of humor, but you're also very strong in your views and you're not afraid. And I really love that you care so much, you know, and I know that you're just, you're getting into politics because you care. You want to make a change. You want things to, to change for the better and be, be kind of, you know, driven by someone that cares about God and, and about people. So yeah, cheers to you. And I'm going to be your biggest supporter. Um, when are My you running for office, Lynn? Uh, well, I don't know. Look, I feel like I have a lot of limiting belief around that. Like, look, I care about people. I do want to change lives. I do feel like I'm not afraid to take the challenge. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm just the type that aren't scared of challenge. However, the things I'm telling myself is I have no idea about politics. I am pretty dumb in that area. You know, like I'm not smart enough. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, you know. And so I, I, it's parked there. I can want to how i don't know so it's very like baby seed stage you know we'll, we'll work at that we'll, we'll, yeah. turn into a, we'll turn you into a dangerous political machine yeah. we'll and you know um the other thing about going from against all odds is that the more challenges we get through the more we realize we can get through more and more like we just become like that's why my friends or people always what else are you changing into you're always doing this and you're doing that and I'm, it's because you just get so amazed at what you can achieve and how much impact you can make. And you also realize that if I could have gone through the darkest time and didn't know how I was going to get out and I did, well, I can do more. I can repeat again, if you know what I mean. And so that's my experience. Oh, what would you say about that? No, I, I, th I think it's spot on. I think it's all a matter of baby steps getting better. And um, I suppose it is, is that every time you recover from, a bad experience on the back of God, when you reach the end of that, you know, dark path, you kind of look back on it and saying, it makes you tougher every time because 
you know, your faith improves through challenge and adversity, right? You know, good times does not make you a person of faith. Yeah. It's tragically darker times make you a person of faith. Right? Yeah. And it's just, it's just the way it goes. Yeah. Everyone, no one ever becomes a Christian for good reasons. It's all, <laughs> no one ever does. It's like, wow, I just made a million dollars and, you know, I can, you know, I've got, you know, all these lovely ladies or men love me and I've got these expensive cars. I'm going to become a Christian now. No one does that. Yeah. It's always for negative reasons. It's always be, well, I lost this, I lost this, or I have this big problem. This whole secular globalistic frame of reference is breaking down. What are other answers? And what, yeah. I, and what I say to people, actually, and I'll use this as an example. Um, yeah, I'm very, I'm completely inclusive of all religions. Again, I'll say this again. Um, at the end of the day, I'm pro-faith. I'm not pro-Christianity per se. Mm-hmm. I'll use an example. One of my um, young Muslim friends a few weeks ago, obviously I'll protect their identity, um, really lost, really misguided right now. Ed, what do I do? I told him, I didn't sit, I could have sold him Jesus if I wanted to, but I didn't. I said, do you have a mosque nearby? Yeah, I, there's a mosque uh, down the road. I'm, I've been there a few times. Go back there. Mm. Talk to the imam or cleric. You know, go in yeah. there. Yeah. Well, just, just be honest to say, look, I've done a few bad things. I'm really sorry. And he'll help you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the point is, is the point I'm making is that, and I was saying this to one of my friends in America the other day, a lot of the problems we're seeing in the world is due to the lack of faith. That's a problem. Faith is what unifies humanity and civilization. If we all got more into our faith, we'd all be way better off. Yeah. And see, the, the last point I have is that you turn to faith. God is going to start to give you messages, going to start to give you signs, give you opportunities, or someone come, pops up. You still got to do the freaking work. That's the thing. People, you know, the reason why their life can't change is that they just, go, what do I do next? And then they get given thing, but then they're like, but I don't want to do the work or, or I'm too, yeah, it's not going to work. You know, God isn't going to just hold your hand and pop at you <laughs> around. It's an armchair. We call them ATM Christians or armchair Christians. Interesting. <laughs> so but, sit around and yeah, yeah. yeah well, ATM Christian is, oh God, I've run out of money. Can you top up my account? Like that's an ATM. Yeah. yeah. Where, an armchair Christian is, oh, I just pray to God. And my life still sucks. Damn you, God. Yeah, you just you just sitting in your armchair complaining about God. Yeah, exactly. Well, what would be the last message you have for someone going through some pretty dark time right now and go, okay, what's next? Yeah, I would say exactly what I said to my very good young Muslim friend watching. If you're watching, you're very handsome and good looking. Remember that. But to my young Muslim friend, he knows who he is, right? Um, I would say go into your faith. So whatever, again, I'm again, as much as I'm a pro Christian, I'm not here to sell Christianity. I'm here to sell faith. So whatever your faith go into it, you know, and it's very important. And wherever you are, right. There is always someone you can speak to, you know, it could, if you're completely not into faith, it might be speaking to your yoga instructor who you think is pretty spiritual and cool. A lot of yoga people are quite spiritual. Um, you might come from a particular cultural background, go speak to someone like a faith leader in your community and get them to help you. Because when you, when you get help from a faith leader, it's going to help set you on the right track. They, yes. know what, they know what's going on. They've got the community, they've got the resources, they've got the systems to help you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap up. My son is calling me. It's, I'm, I'm working from home. The kid's calling. He's gone to the toilet. And yeah. So if you're watching this, uh, if you've, you've got value, please write it, comments below. Ask us any question. Connect with Edward on LinkedIn, Instagram, everywhere. He's everywhere. And if you have any questions, put it down below and we can answer it in our next video. But thank you so much, Edward, for your time. It's an honor. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you. Cheers. Bye.